Well, welcome to this tutorial, which is going to look at how to achieve uh, the fluid transformation effect. And you'll have probably seen on Vimeo and elsewhere a couple of examples using real flow of liquids being transformed from one shape into another. And it's perfectly possible to do this in Houdini. And indeed, Houdini's flexibility gives you a lot of control about how to achieve it. So in this case, we're going to take uh, fluid in the shape of the letter A and transform it into some fluid in the shape of the letter B. And we're going to add a couple of extra uh, subtleties to this which uh, make it look more interesting. Now, there are a number of ways uh, that you could do it. I'm going to do it by using flip fluids and a pop solver and using an attract pop node. But before we get into all of that, uh, we need to convert both of these letters into fluids. In other words, fill them with points. So let me start off by doing that for letter B. So what I'm going to do is add from the fluid tab here uh, points from volume. And I'm going to keep this at a relatively low point separation, point 0.1. So that gives us just a thousand points. Now, obviously, in a production situation, you'd want to use a much smaller point separation and many more points. Uh, but in order to keep the simulation fast, I'm going to keep it at this low level. I'm going to turn off Convert to Fog because I find that can sometimes uh, crash Houdini. So we'll leave that off. And obviously, to visualize the points, uh, we need to enable Point View here. Now, before we get into using fluids, I want to demonstrate how this works with a simple pop network. So I've laid down a pop network here. I've merged in uh, our letter A points. And then I'm just sourcing at the first frame one point, one, one particle for each of those points in the letter A. And there are two ways that I can get the points here, or these particles, to move towards the points that I set up in the letter B. Uh, there's a follow pop, and there's an attractor pop. Now the follow pop is generally better uh, when you want to get one set of particles to follow another set within a single simulation. So in this case, I'm going to use the attractor pop. Now, the attractor pop requires us to specify some geometry, so I'm going to specify our letter B. And uh, we're going to need to set up some attributes on the points that make up letter B before this is going to work. So let's do that. Let's go into letter B. And I can set up those attributes using a point sob. If we have a look uh, at the force tab on a point sop, we can see we've got a number of attributes that we can add relating to forces on the points. Uh, and what we want to do is add some radius, and I'm going to give these a radius of 3. Uh, this determines the radius within which this force that we're attaching to these points will have an effect. I'm going to add a force scale and leave it at 1, and I'm going to add some radial force, and radial force uh, attracts objects that are subject to the force in towards the center of the point. And that, of course, is what we want to happen to these points here uh, that make up letter A. So that's now sorted out the attributes we need for our attractor to work. So what happens if we now press play? or step through our simulation, we can see our points are attracted off towards the B, and then they just fly out uh, at huge speed. Well, the reason for that is because by default, all of the points of letter B are, are being sort of clumped together and used as a single force that's attracting all of these points. And of course, that's going to accelerate them very greatly, and they're going to fly off over here. So that's obviously not what we want. We want something else. What we want to do is use a single point per particle. 
And this means that the points here, the particles that we got here, will each be attracted to an equivalent or corresponding point in the points that we set up on letter B. And we're going to need to add a couple more attributes to make this work properly. Let me go back to letter A. And what I'm going to do is use an attribute create. And I'm going to create a point attribute. It's going to be an integer. And I'm going to call it ATT. Call it anything we like. And I'm going to give it a value of $PT. Uh, and that means that the each of these points is going to have an attribute with the point number of that point. And I'll show you how we're going to use this. If we go back into our POP network, uh, I'm going to need to set up an attribute on each of our particles to tell each particle which point of the letter B they should be aiming for. Uh, and I can do this using a property pop. Let's lay one down. Uh, and here on the miscellaneous tab we can see that there's an option to add an attractor point. So let's delete that. Now I've set up an attribute on our points which I can now draw on because the attribute that I set up on the points here is going to be inherited by our particles when they're sourced. So I need the point number of the current point we're looking at and the attribute which is ATT and the index which is going to be zero because it's only an integer. And what this should have done is for each of these particles set up a point which it's aiming at. Let's just have a look at the details view to see whether that's happened. And we can see each of these has a, a tract property which corresponds to the ATT property. Uh, you may ask why it was that I didn't just directly set up an attract property in the SOPs uh, that uh, fed into this POP network. Well, for some reason that doesn't actually work. You have to set up the attractor point using uh, a property pop like this. So let's see what that now looks like. So I've set up my property pop, set up my attractor. I'm going to select stop at attractor. So when each of these points reaches the equivalent point in B, it's going to stop. So let's just move this forward and we can see these are all flying about and then they don't actually reach the end there but uh, let me increase the scale a bit that may help us reach this by the end of the simulation there we go well we've got a a bit of a problem here which is you can see that our letter B is incomplete and the reason for that of course is that there are more points in the letter B than there are in the letter A so we're going to need to add points to the letter A in order to make sure that the letter B is completely filled with points at the end of this simulation so let's do that so we go into the letter A and what I'm going to do, in fact, is insert this before we create our attribute. And I'm going to start with a delete SOP. And I'm going to delete by expression. And I'm going to delete all the points whose point number is greater than the number of points in letter B. In fact, let me let me lay down a null here so that we can mark where we're going to be collecting the number of points. 
so I'm deleting all of the points that have a number greater than the number of points in letter B out point number minus the number of points Let's turn caps off in this SOP here. So I'm going to take the number of points after the points from volume. So what should happen, and I'm deleting points here, is that after this must be a let me just enlarge this and check that I haven't made a an error here. I have I've left the S off this expression. So this has left us now with 221 points. And in fact, this is the number of points difference between the two primitives. So if I merge the points that I've just created back together with the original points, what I should find is that I have 1061 points and in letter P I have 1060 points so there's a difference of one I think if I change this to greater than or equal to we should find that it's the same so we've now got the same number of points in each so what we should now find when we try our pop network is that the B completely fills up again I'm going to need to increase the scale of this attractor So the B completely fills up, but we can see that there are some difficulties with this. A couple of things are a problem with this. One of which is that the points are not particularly traveling to the nearest point in the letter B. And that may not be a problem when we're coming to use this in a pop network. But if we were trying to use this, or when we try and use this for flip fluids, it's not going to look very good. The second problem we've got is those duplicate points that we added are all in fact being added at a single part. I think they're over here. So that's also going to look odd. The, the extra density, if you like, in the fluid is, is all in one place rather than being distributed throughout the letter. So let's try and fix both of those things. And we can do that by doing a little bit of trickery here in the letter A. So the first thing I'm going to do is add after this a sort SOP. Now a sort SOP enables you to rearrange the point numbers of the points that are in your object. And of course the delete SOP is working using point numbers. So if I randomize the point SOP. It's going to reorder these points in a random order and therefore uh, when we come to this delete SOP we can see that the points that are, are being added in are spread throughout the letter. If we have this disabled we could see that they were all across one side of the letter. So let's re-enable that. The next problem is that, as we saw, the points weren't particularly corresponding to equivalent points on the two letters. And the reason for that is that the letters point numbers are not necessarily sorted in the same way. So the next thing that I need to do is, before we create uh, our point, I need to sort uh, the letters in a different way, Let's sort the points in a different way. So I'm going to sort them 
by y. So now the point numbers are going to start at low numbers here at the bottom of the letter and increase towards the maximum here at the top of the letter. And obviously I want the same thing to be true here. So we now should find, if we play this, that there's an error of some kind. Let's have a look again at letter A. And the problem is I've left the display flag on the merge rather than the attribute create. So let's now see whether that's working a little bit better. So now we can see there's a much more disciplined, nicer motion of our points onto the letter B. So what we need to do is now reproduce the same effect using flip fluids. Well, you may wonder why I'm going to use flip fluids than any other type of fluid. There are two reasons, one of which is, as of the very latest builds of Houdini, there's an ability to choose which individual particles in a simulation are subject to the flip fluid solver and which aren't, and I'm going to use that later on. And the second reason is that this technique that we've used here of doubling up some of the points in our letter works fine for flip fluids because the flip fluid solver can handle a fluid simulation where the particles of the fluid are in exactly the same place to start with. However, the normal SPH fluid solver tends to find that situation very difficult. And what you would find is if you tried to create a fluid based on this setup we've got here using the SPH uh, fluid solver, then your fluid would explode at the beginning of the simulation because it would be trying to those particles would be trying to force each other apart and that would create an unstable simulation so that's why we're using SPH uh, this, that's why we're using flip fluids rather than SPH so we're going to create our fluid from our letter A so I'm going to go up to the particle fluids tab and I'm going to click flip fluid and let's go into our auto.net network and if I, I've got to display only things in this context, so where's our fluid gun? Well, the answer is that by default, our shelf tool has set this up to expect a surface to be the incoming geometry rather than a set of points. So I'm going to need to change this to particle field. And now we can see that we've got our particles here. I'm going to change this so that we're visualizing them as particles and there we can see them the other thing i'm going to do just for safety's sake is go in here copy this point separation value and then in the auto.network paste it in here so that we're always using the same point separation. So let's just have a look at what the shelf tool has set up for us here. We've got our flip solver. Uh, we've got some gravity. And we've got a pop solver here. And in fact, I'm going to disable the gravity because I don't need that to affect my fluids. A pop solver is really just a way of applying pop nodes to the particles which make up a fluid. And in this case, of course, we don't need to apply the pop nodes uh, sourcing. We just don't need a source node in here because the particles are already being created using this uh, set of nodes here. But we can 
add in to here equivalent nodes to the ones that we had in our other pop network. So I'm going to pause the video and copy those across. So I've copied those two nodes across. They're exactly the same uh, as we had before. And we can do that because the particles that are part of the fluid have also inherited this ATT attribute that we set up in the SOP network. So we can just use that to set up the attractor point. And the attractor pop uh, works uh, in the same way as well. So let's have a look and see what that looks like. So there are my points making up my fluid. And we can see there's a lot of waving about. So one of the things I probably want to do is to add some drag into my system. So let's get out of the pop solver and add in a drag force. I'm going to leave it with the default values, but I'm going to set it to ignore the mass of the particles and see whether that has any effect. We can see things are moving a little. Yep, that's settling. That's settling down now much more than it was before. So we're beginning to get there. I probably need to just tweak the settings here on the attractor pop. So let's increase this up to say 10.5. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore the charge on the particles and the mass on the particles. So let's rewind and see how that now works. And that's that's settling down pretty well. Well, is that uh, sufficient for our simulation? Let me go up to the object level. Let's turn off our test pop network. And we can see that uh, the shelf tool has produced this node letter A fluid. So the letter A fluid contains a node with the display flag on it. That's what's creating this visualization of all the points. But it also has this particle fluid surface node. And the particle fluid surface nodes will actually show us a will actually show us a surfaced a surfaced letter. And obviously at the moment we haven't got enough particles to make that look very good. Let me increase the number of particles that we've got by reducing say this to point eight. Let's try that. Does that look any good? That's looking a little bit better. Let's put it down to 0.5. That's much better. Okay, so let's have a look at what this looks like when we look at a surfaced fluid. And I'm going to turn off the display of points. And what I'm going to do is render out a flipbook, uh, but I'm going to pause the video while I do that. Now, to render out a flipbook, you can just click this. Uh, so this node here, and you get this dialog. Uh, in this case, we can just accept the standard parameters. And that'll start rendering out, but I'm going to pause the video. Well, that's now rendered out. And if we play it through, we can see a couple of problems with this. One of the problems is that it's taking quite a long time to settle these particles here, just milling around on the edges of the letter. Uh, and the second problem, which perhaps is less easy to see, uh, but if you look at this area up here, which ought to be settled because it's, it's basically reached its destination, we can see that it in fact shimmers. And that's going to be very visible when we come to, to render this. So we need to sort out both of those problems. Well, at least one of these 
issues is going to be solved using a facility which is new to the latest builds of Houdini 11. I'm using Houdini 11.0.610 here and I think this particular feature came in at about 0.600. If we have a look at our flip solver, uh, we can he see here on the volume motion tab that there's a parameter called force override. Let's enable it. Now what this means is that the fluid type forces, or at least some of them, and we'll see that in a minute, can be enabled and disabled for individual particles based on the value of an attribute that will be on those particles. And by default, uh, the name of that attribute is ballistic. So where a particle has a ballistic attribute with a value of zero, then the flip solver will treat it entirely normally. Uh, where it has a ballistic value of one, then the flip solver will ignore it. It won't affect its velocity. Now, of course, that particle may still affect the velocities of other particles in the fluid that are nearby, but it itself will no longer be affected by the fluid forces inside the flip solver. And we can see there's a, a, a little bit of a subtlety to that in a moment when we set this up. So I'm going to need to set up a bounding box around my letter B. And what I'm going to do is that when my particles get inside uh, that bounding box, I'm going to have them stop being solved as a fluid and just be solved as a standard particle. And that way, that will converge much more quickly to the shape of the letter B. So the first thing we need to do is set up a suitable bounding box for our letter. So I'm going to have to do that before, I think, before we change it into points. So let me middle click here and add a bound sob. And that gives us a bounding box around the letter. And I'm going to give it a little bit of padding in each direction, say 0.2. So it's going to be ending up just a little bit bigger than the letter. And then I'm going to add a null. And let's call this letter bounds. So we can now use this inside our auto.network and indeed inside our pop solver. So we're going to be using this property, ballistic. So I need to set up a property called ballistic for all of our particles. So I'm going to use an attribute, SOP, a pop rather, to set up this ballistic attribute and I'm going to start off with a value of zero. So to start with it's going to ensure that all of the particles are going to be solved as if they were a fluid. The next thing I need to do is use a group pop and what I want to do is select out those particles which are in the letter bounds. And let's call the group the same thing in letter bounds. And I can do that by using $OS. So the name of the group will be the same as the name of the node. Uh, and I'm going to use the bounding method. And I'm not going to use a bounding box. I'm going to use a bounding object. And I'm going to select the letter bounds null that we just set up. And the other thing I'm going to do is preserve group. So when a particle has entered this group, it will always remain inside the group. So even if a particle enters this bounding box and then for some reason leaves it, it's still going to be inside it. And then I'm going to use another attribute and I'm going to call this set ballistic and we need to set the value of ballistic to 1 
for the particles that are in the letter bounds group. So what this is going to do is for the particles that enter this bounding box, they're going to stop behaving like a fluid and they're just going to move straight to the destination point as if they were just in a simple pop network. Well, let's see whether that's working. And it looks like we've got a problem. Let me have a look up here. And the issue is that I've, I've put the display flag here on letter bounds rather than on the end of the part of the network which has our points in. And that's an illustration of why it's always a good idea not to refer to a sub-object by its container, but to put down a null. Let's try and do that properly. Put down a null and call it something. Let's call it letter letter B points out. And then rather than referring to this sop by the container, we should refer to it by that specific null. And let's see whether that's fixed the problem. So now our particles are moving in and they are indeed converging much more quickly. Now you may just be able to see on, on this video, but I'm going to do a, a, a flipbook render in a moment, that the problem of jiggling hasn't gone away. So in fact, let me start a flipbook render. I'm going to do that at the object level so that we have a surface fluid. So let's render a flipbook. I'm going to pause the video while that's happening. So that's now rendered out that flipbook. So it's we can see that the jiggling issue is still there at the end. And it took me a while to work out why that was happening. And in fact, the reason for it is that this new feature of the flip solver of suppressing forces using an attribute on the particles doesn't apply to all of the forces that the flip solver generates. In particular, it doesn't apply to this part of the flip solver, uh, the part which keeps particles apart. So in order to avoid that jiggling, we need to switch off the keep particles apart. Now that is going to create a fluid motion that's perhaps slightly less realistic uh, than a real fluid. Uh, but in practice, it doesn't seem to change that much. So let's now see what that looks like. And probably possible to see even uh, with this point display here that those points are no longer jiggling about. The other thing that I thought was not particularly elegant about that render that we just did was that there were sort of points popping back out of the surface. And one way to try and uh, suppress that is to add some extra drag here in our pop network and I'm doing it in the pop network because I want to apply the drag only to the points that are inside the bounding box here. Uh, and if I ignore mass, then it should ensure that we get a little bit of extra drag for the points that enter there, which means they should settle down more quickly. And of course, perhaps I failed to mention earlier on, one of the key things that we've enabled is stop at attractor. So as soon as the point reaches the point that it's being attracted to, it will stop. So let's try one more flipbook render of that to see whether it's working. And again, uh, I'm uh, doing the flipbook render at the wrong place. Let's do it inside the fluid.
So let's do a flipbook render. I'm going to pause the video. So the flipbook render is rendered out. And we can see now that once it settles down, it's in fact perfectly still. So that's the end of the first part of this fluid effect. But in order to add a little bit of extra interest, what I want is for it to appear that some of the fluid, as it goes towards the letter here, if you like, misses and flies on and splashes onto a floor. So in the second part of this tutorial, that's what we're going to look at achieving.